<laughs> so um, it's really important that we understand the times and seasons that we're in, and we're going to talk about that today. That, um, you know, a few, I guess it was back in April, we did the first uh, celebration that the Lord asked us to do forever. He said, there's three feasts I want you to celebrate. It was Passover which the Christian church calls Easter, Resurrection Sunday, but it's totally connected with Passover. And then 50 days later was what? Pentecost. Pentecost, and that was the giving of the law back in the Old Testament, but now we know it's the second chapter of Acts, which was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And anybody know what the next one is coming, the third one? Tabernacles. Okay, that's coming up in October this year. It's usually September. It's in the fall every year, but just because of the difference in the Jewish calendar and our calendar, it's, uh, it's going to come in October this year. And, and we're in this season where we're going from Pentecost, which, again, is our infilling of our Holy Spirit, and, and to the time of tabernacles, which we'll think about and study as the summer goes by. But we're only going to talk about a little bit today as that third dimension. Because coming out of Egypt is pretty clear what God was doing, right? He took them out of slavery to the Egyptians. And when we were in slave enslaved to sin, we were not in control of our lives. Amen? We, we were following the devil. But God brought you through the Red Sea, didn't he? Amen. How many of you here are saved? So right there, you got delivered from the Egyptian slavery of the devil, and you're no longer a slave to that sin anymore. And that should make you very happy. Amen. And that's why we like to worship and why we like to celebrate, and why we like to dance. It's just good to remind yourself that even when the circumstances may cause you to feel like, oh, man, I'm a little discouraged today, that you remind yourself, no, I serve a God who's alive and well. He's resurrected. That same Spirit's inside me. And regardless of this temporary affliction that I might be going through, I might need an answer, but he's going to give me the answer because he's a good father, and he knows, how to, he knows how to give me the right answers. And then he filled me with the Spirit. And that's such a powerful gift that we have. And remember John the Baptist, Jesus said that he was the greatest prophet in the Old Testament, but even the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. Why is that? Holy Spirit. Because you got filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? Now, that's pretty good, isn't it? doesn't matter. You don't have to qualify. You don't have to submit a resume and apply for the job. When you become a Christian, you get filled with his spirit. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in you and empowers you. So, of course, the enemy would try to shut that down, try to bring shame, try to get you to focus on what you're not. But the Bible says what we are, priests and kings. And that's part of what this tabernacle season is about. Because it's one thing when you're in slavery to the Egyptians and you've got to listen to Pharaoh. And then they're 40 years in the desert and they don't know what to do. God gives them the law so that they have a blueprint on how to follow. But he gave us a better thing. He gave us Holy Spirit. So we don't have to go to stone tablets anymore. It says that he's written on, the, on our hearts, right? So he, we have a covenant relationship with him where he's living inside of us, and our body is now a temple of the Holy Spirit. But the third dimension is what happens with tabernacles is they get the land. And that, with that blessing comes responsibility. You've got to rule. What's the thing about being a king? You can't pass the buck. The buck stops here. That was on the desk of one of our presidents. He had a plaque on his desk. The buck stops here. Because people are tempted to pass the buck. Right. <laughs> it's not my job. Give it to Tricia. <laughs> no, no. The buck stops with you when you're the king. Right. And, you know, the dad role, we just celebrated Father's Day two weeks ago, right? That's, that's a good biblical role of somebody with, that has to say the buck stops here. Who's paying the bills? Who's doing the budget? Who's in charge? And, and it's, a, it's a partnership, husband and wife, right? We submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, but somebody has to be in charge. But if you've been in slavery for 400 years, and then you wandered in the desert for another 40, and you get your land, it's not so easy to know how to rule. And when the devil comes and tries to intimidate you, you don't have that treasure chest full of what your father did what your mother did, because you don't know what it was like to rule, and God teaches us that you are kings, but you'll be a much more effective king if you're lined up as a priest. <laughs> we were in a, a men's Bible study, and we were asking each other, what is the thing that would make your wife feel most secure? 
because that's the highest priority for a woman, is to feel safe. And the highest priority for a man, this is all biblical, is to feel respected. So how would a woman feel respected, at least in my house, is she needs to know that I'm in the word, that I'm praying, that I have my priorities properly aligned, and that God comes first, even before her. Say amen, Trish. She said it. I know you think you heard it, but she said it. So for for a marriage to really succeed in the Lord, your spouse needs to love the Lord more than they love you. That's actually the best thing that could happen to you, is that you marry somebody who's that deep in love with God. But if I go a week or two and she's sensing, boy, he doesn't seem like he's been in the Word lately. He's been a little agitated. He's been a little carnal. He's been a little sarcastic recently. I mean, sarcasm is not one of the fruits of the Spirit. There's no translation in the Bible that says sarcasm is one of the fruits of the Spirit. It's a sign of bitterness that's starting to pop up on the inside of you. It's funny. (laughs) Okay, I got a no in the front. (laughs) I mean, deep down, it it isn't because you're usually making fun of something of somebody. It's funny in the moment because it's usually true. The thing that's being exploited, there's some truth behind it, but you're not treating them the way you'd want to be treated because we got enough people pointing out our flaws in the world, don't we? But we need some life-giving priests who understand the role of a king, which is to speak life, not death. So look, you know, she's not going to feel safe if she doesn't think I'm praying and reading my Bible and spending time with the Lord because the first question Trisha will always ask me is, what did the Lord say? That's a blessing. But it's a lot of work, right? You can't just assume that this is the right way to handle a situation. And, you know, thank God for godly wives and godly husbands that aren't going to just operate in the natural. We work off a different kingdom. And men, I don't know if I should make such a broad general statement, but in general, the jokes are that we don't even like to stop and ask for directions because that's like some kind of sign of weakness that we had to ask for help. And prayer can be interpreted, interpreted as weakness because you shouldn't have to ask. That's a lie. Let's just sever that lie right now. God wants us in dialogue, talking to him all the time. And man, I just, I was so blown away by the Passion Translation again, right here in Revelation 1, 5, and 6. I'm going to read it. It's the text again. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from among the dead, And the ruling king, okay? So we know he's the king of kings. It's right here. (laughs) It's right in the name. You can't miss it. He's the king of kings. And it should be your king for sure. But he's the kings of the kings of the earth. Now to the one who constantly loves us and has loosed us from our sins by his blood, and to the one who has made us to rule, come on, as a there it is. It's a kingly priesthood. You and I are part of a kingly priesthood. And I'll repeat a couple of times just because I want the picture to be there for you. They weren't used to that in the Old Testament. They were used to a king. And then they were used to the priests. And they were following the orders of the Lord on the priests, but God wasn't too thrilled about the king part, right? Remember King Saul? The people were getting jealous of the other nations, and they said, we want a king like the other nations. How did that work out? (laughs) Not too good. But then King David brought a redemptive quality to the the king and the priest's role. And then Jesus had to be from the line of David. So there's clearly something there, right? And then we also hear this name Melchizedek in the New Testament. And he's a combination of a king and a priest. So there's these pictures of what we're supposed to be. But at the end of the day, when we wake up in the morning, we should feel like we're on a mission. How many feel that way? I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. Because if you don't, that's okay. We're going to pray that you do. Lord, anybody in here who doesn't feel they're on a mission for you, wake them up to that mission. Wake them up. Light a fire on the inside of them so that when they wake up in the morning, they're excited and they say, oh, what's the adventure today, Lord? What's the great adventure that we're going to be on today? You have made me a king and a priest. And I'm going to fulfill both of those roles. The, the, The buck stops here part means I'm going to have to make some tough decisions. I'm going to have to confront some things that don't feel comfortable in the time that I'm confronting them. You all know that feeling, right? Now, not everybody is afraid of confrontation, but most of us would be a little reluctant to engage, and we can read the Bible in kind of a a sissified way if we're not careful. Because it's not just 
be weak and turn the other cheek every time you get confronted about something. That, that verse is misunderstood. He was the lion and the lamb. He was a worshiper, but he was a warrior, the greatest warrior. There's nothing sissified about a warrior going to the cross on your behalf. And he wasn't some skinny string bean looking guy. He was a carpenter. They didn't have power tools. He was carrying all that stuff around, man. He looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm telling you, he was built. And they weren't just using wood. There was not as much wood as there was stones. If you were a carpenter, you were building with stone. So this idea that he was some skinny little weakling, that's a problem. Oh, no. He was a man's man. But he was strong enough that he didn't have to fight flesh with flesh. <laughs> that's a godly king. You have the authority but you choose not to use it unless you have to. But knowing that you have to use it sometimes is really important, isn't it? That's part of the king. Sometimes we have to go to war. It's the way it works. There's an enemy that wants to take you out. So we're going to try to balance those two things out today through Scripture. I'm going to go to the next one. And again, it just says, don't turn away on your third day. So what does that mean? Third day is a big thing in the Bible, right? He rose from the dead on the third day. And, and there's these stages. Anybody play football? Because I mean, we're coming into football season. God loves football. You know that, right? Yes. Paul loves sports. He was always using sports analogies. And football is a lot like war. It's a lot like battle. And anybody know what the season we're coming into for football is called training camp, right? That's like boot camp if you went into the Army. Any veterans? How was boot camp? Horrible. Didn't take them long to say that, did it? Same with training camp. Well, I was in the University of Miami in Florida in August, okay, playing football. It was 98 degrees, and it was 99% humidity. And uh, I had some big dudes wanting to take my head off, but I was quicker than they were, so they just couldn't catch me. <laughs> but, like, you know, it was kids that were kind of groomed from the time they were three. They were eating raw steaks for breakfast. I'm sure one of them was named Bubba. And like he wasn't there for the classroom time. He was there to kill people on the football field. <laughs> and 98 degrees and 99% humidity, man, horrible. And there were three sessions. It wasn't even double sessions. It was triple sessions. So after the first session at 11 o'clock, you know, like you're wiped out. You got to go back out at 1230. And then they make you do more at 4 in the afternoon because it's a lot like Hell week for the SEALs. They want to see who's going to quit, right? So if you love what you're doing, you don't want to quit. The thing is, it's really hard. So when we first get saved, it's really hard, isn't it? you got a whole lot of things you got to put to death. Crucify it. you got to bring it to the cross. You don't fix it. You kill it. And dying is not fun. Those things cry on the way out, don't they? They don't like dying. But they have to die. That's the only way it works. Because then it will be re resurrected on the other side. You don't fix it. You kill it. Things don't like to die. So it might take a while. That's that boot camp time. Then what do you do after boot camp? You do like a simulation. You, you fight against the other team. Your, your own team. I'm sorry. They, they'll, they'll make teams. What do they call it? Maneuvers. You go on maneuvers. And it's really your side, but they have a different badge on. Different color. You're not shooting them with real bullets, but you're pretending. And then you go to war. And they're not pretending. They're shooting live bullets. And it's the same with sports. After you go through training camp, you do what they call scrimmaging. Anybody know that one? What a scrimmage is? You're playing against your own team. Offense and defense are playing against each other. And you, you got to hold back a little bit. Because if you hurt the quarterback, you get killed in the locker room. Like, don't you know it was a scrimmage? You're supposed to go hard, but not so hard that you hurt your own teammate. But how do you do that in football? It's really hard because if you don't go full speed, you get hurt because you don't know when the other guy is forgetting that and he's going to take your head off, right? So warfare is every day for us. The boot camp was getting saved and coming from the milk to the meat because to be a strong, mature Christian, you had to survive a lot of temptations, didn't you? Still do, but you know, the stronger your immune system is, the greater your walk will be, and there'll be more fruit in your walk. 
But, you know, there's just thousands and thousands of times that you come to that fork in the road and you have to decide what you're going to do. And when you're a new Christian, you just don't have that root system yet to know how to do it in a way that's a godly answer. You're trying to translate what the Bible says into the immediate need in this situation. And wouldn't you just love to have a seasoned Christian with you there all the time to say, what should I do? But you don't. But who do you have? The Holy Spirit is right in you. Now, if you didn't put the deposit of the Word in first, you didn't give Him much to work with. So if you're ever like in Japan and you don't know the language, in the old days you used to have to get out your little book and look up the words. Now it's so easy. You just speak into a phone in English and it translates out to them for, for Japanese. It's amazing, isn't it? It's how it should be for us with the Lord. Every situation we walk into, we're not sure what to do, that we have like instant translation of how I should handle this situation in this moment. I call that a moment of truth. When you're not sure what to do, you come up on a situation and you're at that fork in the road. How many do 100% right thing every time? <laughs> no hands are going up. But don't you want your average to go up? You want to keep doing better at what the Lord would want, not what I would want, not what my flesh would want, but what the Lord would want. That's the moment of truth I'm talking about. And that's a third day situation. Because you're not in training camp anymore. This isn't a scrimmage. We're not playing against our own team. This is the enemy trying to take me out. It might not look like it. It might just be a business meeting. It might be somebody setting you up in a business meeting. And they're waiting for you to say something that they can use against you. Not that that would ever happen in corporate America. Right? Happens all the time. If they see talent in you, they might feel threatened by that. And now all of a sudden you walk in thinking, you know, Gomer Pyle, gullible. Oh, everybody's got the best interest for everybody else. Well, you know, not always. No, you're not working with Christians. So be wise as a serpent, but gentle as a dove. So that's not easy, is it? That's why I love this next one, but I'll tell you. This is one of my favorite portions of Scripture. It's from 2 Samuel 23. You got it up there, right? And I've, I've shared from this before, but it's just too important not to get the point across, and it paints such a great picture. So David had just died, and the author of 2 Samuel is listing his mighty men. How many knew about that group of men, mighty men that David had in battle, right? Because he was a mighty warrior. Great example of a worshiper and a warrior. He had a soft side, but he also knew how to kill the enemy. That's the picture that the Christians are supposed to have. And we, we really haven't done a great job on the killing the enemy part. The American church is much better at nurturing and gathering together and being here. This is great. It's really important. But we're supposed to be training you for the warfare that goes on when you're here and when you're outside of here. Because it goes on in here too, doesn't it? All right. So that's where we want to up our game. That's what the season of the summer, Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. I'm going to give you the land, but you're going to have to rule the land or else the enemy will run you over. And ruling the land takes responsibility and courage and takes difficult decisions in that moment of truth. You can't walk away in your third day. You can't turn away when that rubber meets the road and you have to decide what to do. And this guy, wow, the first one listed. It says in 2 Samuel 23, 8, these are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joshub, and it was a longer name after that, but I just took the first part. Chief among the captains. you got to say this with me. He had killed. <laughs> what? He killed 800 men at one time. That's in the Bible. If it's in the Bible, it's true. Okay? That's why he's at the top of the list. Because that doesn't sound like a walk in the park, does it? One guy killed 800 men. So... That's who you want on your side. That's who you have on your side. How many were here during intercession today? <laughs> that was fired up, wasn't it? Aren't you glad they're on your side? Because when you have a need, that's who's praying for you. Not some wishy-washy prayer, oh, Lord, if it's your will. We got to know his will. It's already in here. What his will is, you got to know it and then speak it out and declare it and proclaim it. So he killed 800. Then the second guy listed is the, really the one I want to talk about. His name is Eleazar. 
But, you know, out of the mighty men, there were three top guys. This is number two. Not bad, number two. As one of the three mighty warriors, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered at Pastimon for battle. Then the Israelites retreated. Not a good thing, is it? You're there and you're taunting, and all of a sudden the people that are with you lose their nerve. And they flee. What do you do? Hmm, not so easy, is it? When everybody else is running in the other direction and you're a warrior, if you're one of David's mighty men, you're at a moment of truth. And you've got to decide, what am I going to do? Am I going to run with the rest of the cowards? Sorry, we're warriors. We're in battle now. This is the game. This isn't a scrimmage anymore. We're not in boot camp. They're dropping real bombs on us. Okay? I don't want to be with a company of people that are retreating. But we do. We have, it happens to us sometimes. Look at this picture. Then the Israelites retreated, but Eleazar stood his ground. Look at your neighbor and say, stand your ground. In the moment of truth, you need to stand your ground in the moment of truth. And what did he do? He struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. <laughs> oh, man, what a picture. That's what a king and a priest is looking like. The battle's over now, Eleazar. You can let go. No, I can't. I became one with my weapon. How cool is that? That's the picture you need. That's who we are. Right now, they probably had to peel his fingers off because his hand froze to the sword. I don't want to go to battle with anybody less than that. You know, like you read about that Hell Week. There's a guy named Marcus Luttrell who uh, wrote the book Lone Survivor. I had the privilege, really, of meeting him at a business meeting. He was the, the featured speaker, and I was help, helping to run the conference. And uh, he was an intense guy. And uh, he was a Navy SEAL. Both he and his twin brother were both Navy SEALs. He's 6'5", 240 pounds. Two twins. And the average size of a SEAL is about 5'8", 5'9", 160, 165 pounds because they spend so much time in the water that having that much muscle and bulk and bone, 240 pounds, is not easy when you're a Navy SEAL. And yet that's the kind of stature these guys had. And he said to us, you know, he had been on 300 deployments. And the only reason he stopped is because he was shot so many times and had so many bones broken that his body just wouldn't allow him to keep going. But his spirit man was saying, I want to be out there with my buddies. Now, he was also still in post-traumatic stress. But I'm just telling you, the, the spirit of a warrior, you couldn't help but just salute the guy. Like, you're on our side, man. I'm sure glad you're on our side. And, you know, there's the stories he told about Hell Week, but... If there was, he said, if there was one ounce in me left, I couldn't quit. And that's the only way he survived because the odds were he should have died. You know, if you read his story, you know, most of us would have said, why bother even trying to escape because there's 150 of them and there's just me and there's just no way. And what happened was a bomb landed near him and it blew him into the cleft of a rock. <laughs> How biblical is that? Right? Like... Every time he would fall down the mountain, the gun would land right next to him. It wasn't even connected. He was crawling on his elbows because everything else was broken and he had been shot. There was just no way you would keep trying. And, and he said, our motto is, if there's even one ounce left in me, you don't quit. You keep going because you never know what's going to happen. Man, I'll tell you, that changed my life. Just meeting that guy it was like he imparted something of courage. And that's what this Eleazar did. And, you know, here's the rest of the story that's not so easy. His hand grew and froze to the sword, grew tired and froze to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. Why? Because of the ones who retreated? No. But because of a brave, courageous Navy SEAL. And yet the men came back. The troops returned to Eleazar, but only to strip the dead. That's like rubbing salt in the wound, isn't it? Because they're taking the spoils of the war without contributing. They nothing but show cowardice, and yet they think they're entitled to some of the spoils of the war. And doesn't say Eleazar stopped them. 
But I'm sure there was some conviction around, oh man, this one guy stood and we ran and he won. That's who we need to be, that person. That's the king and the priest. Not an easy assignment being a king and a priest, is it? Much easier to go ask somebody else to interpret the book for you than to spend time when you're not sure what it says and have to keep digging in. And I'm not saying don't do that. You should do that. There's wisdom in a multitude of counsel. But at the end of the day, you need conviction about your decisions. You need to know you heard from the Lord and you're not following somebody else's counterfeit advice. Amen? So you got the Eleazar picture in your brain? Say yes, it'll go well for you. Okay, good. So I already touched on this. In April, we did uh, Passover. That's the resurrection. June, we did Pentecost. That's equivalent with the Holy Spirit in the second chapter of Acts. Now we're coming up on Tabernacles, which I'm going to say is our season of ruling as a kingly priesthood. Okay? They didn't know how to do that. They got lands that they weren't expecting, that they didn't build. They knew it was going to be a promised land, but they didn't have to build those houses. They didn't have to plant those crops. And if you didn't have to work for it, you don't know what to do with it. You don't know the price it took to get there. And it was still a blessing, but God had to teach them about stewardship and responsibility. And isn't it interesting? I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but he said, I'm not going to give you all the land at once. I'm going to give it to you a piece at a time so you can grow into your gifting. So you don't have to despise the process that you're in. You got a prophetic word, but you're not seeing it come to pass yet. That's because you're in process. You don't get a lot of amen, so thank you, whoever said that. I put the amplifier on that. Amen. The process isn't fun, but you grow. You grow through it. And I had another friend who played for the Seattle Mariners in, the, in Major League Baseball He's many years ago. And he was uh, not only in uh, Major Leagues for a little while, but he was in camp with Alex Rodriguez, who's a Hall of, Flame, Hall of Fame player. We should have the Hall of Flame. That would be good. But Alex Rodriguez was a Hall of Famer. And uh, he said that nobody could beat that guy and get to the field earlier than Alex Rodriguez. And nobody stayed longer than Alex Rodriguez. That's setting by example, don't you think? I mean, I may not win, but it's not going to be because I wasn't prepared. I, I may lose the game, but it won't be because I was too tired to finish. I was in shape. I did the part I could handle. Now, that could sound like a lot of works mentality. The point is, uh, most times if people are successful, it's not because they got lucky. Right? We don't even believe in that. There's effort that has to go into it. And, and I'm just going to show you a clip from uh, Dutch in a minute, but I just want to talk about this month because it ties in with what we're saying. It's the month of Tammuz, is how I heard somebody else pronounce it. And it's the fourth month. So remember, we started in April. And what was the holiday in April? First one is Passover. And then we came forward 50 days later. That's about two months later. So April, May, June. In June, we celebrated what? Pentecost. And now we're in the fourth month, right? So this is the April that we're in. This is that season of summer where they have to work the fields. But they're used to being a wandering people in the desert. They don't know about working the fields. Anybody been a farmer before? Man, it's hard work. Got one over here. Not too many, but man, it's hard work, isn't it? Every day, the animals want to be fed. They don't care what day it is. You got to get up and feed them. And, and the crops and any, all the work that goes into it. So Israel had to relearn. Now the benefit of having land that you can harvest is you stop wandering. But you have to steward that gift that God gave you and you have to make tough decisions along the way. That's the kingly part. All right? I don't want to beat that point to death. But this is what our newsletter said this month about this month. It's a month of covenant rights which are linked with power and strength. This is the month where Israel sinned, what, how did she sin? By what? Choosing, can you read it? By choosing to create and worship a golden calf rather than the creator. I just wanted to focus on choosing because remember that fork in the road comes. That moment of truth comes. And when Israel was waiting for Moses to come back, they took the wrong fork in the road, didn't they? They said, you know what? He's not coming back, Aaron. We need you to make us a God that we can worship because Moses just isn't coming back. Boy, that happens a lot, doesn't it? Where we just pull the trigger too fast. If, if I'm a priestly king and I'm hearing from the Lord, 
He'll help me rule my spirit and not get hijacked by fear. But if I get in my Saulish realm, Saul was a king, but he was, a, he was driven by his manly flesh, his soulishness. He wasn't committed to God. And he did a very similar thing. He offered up the sacrifice. When Samuel told him to wait, he rushed it. And the people pressured Aaron, and he ended up making that golden calf. But they chose that. See, this is the month, that fourth month, You come out of Passover and Pentecost. Now you're entering into this third dimension. See what I mean by that? It's not training camp. It's not maneuvers. It's war. Now you have to say, the buck stops here. I'm the king, and I'm also going to be the priest. Hope it's making sense to you. What would a golden calf look like in your life? Leah asked when she wrote the newsletter this month. (laughs) Because that's what we have to be aware of. They're always there, aren't they? But the more on fire you keep yourself for the Lord, the more you burn for him, the less likely you're going to create a golden calf. And God hates golden calves. He said, tear down idols. Don't have any other idols before me. This is a regular daily thing you should do, right? Start your day with communion in the morning. Dedicate your day to the Lord. Say, I want to detox today. I want a fresh start. I don't want any golden calves. And then similarly, it's also the month that the spies came back. And what did Israel do? They chose to come into agreement with the negative report. Same thing, right? Fork in the road. We got two spies saying we can take the land. They chose to listen to the 10 spies. And that's not being a king, is it? Kings rule. They don't take the easy way out. They make the tough decisions. All right, so I'm going to do this Dutch sheets. Got to be careful how you say his name. So I'm going to just list. I'm going to categorize these. We should add the PowerPoint, but next time. Seven different categories of what it looks like and what we've been doing as an oikos, house of God. And when he adds ecclesia, what it looks like. And since I don't have a PowerPoint, I have some little aids here. (laughs) So when I say this side, you're going to see family. And all the pastoral, loving, kind people are going to stand up and probably shout me down. But when I hold this up, what is that? That's ecclesia. So I'm going to go through some of this so quickly. All I want to do is say oikos, ecclesia, and describe what that looks like. Are you with me so far? Can you follow me on this? So, yeah. so you don't need to write. You need to look up here or the screens. Okay. So oikos, crossing over into also the understanding of ecclesia. The first of the seven categories is simply the overall concept, which I've already basically described, so I'll just review it. We are a family. We are a body. We are the bride. We are his flock of sheep. This is the relational aspect of the kingdom of God. Are we going to abandon it? No, we are not. This is the governmental, legislative, congressional side. Ambassadors, warriors, soldiers, the governmental and military side. We've been struggling to enter into this. We haven't done it real well. And in fact, those of us that are trying to do it, you just need to know right now we're a remnant. In fact, we're a remnant of the remnant. There's going to be a tremendous tension between the two. Uh, People telling me all the time, you need to quit talking about the warfare stuff. You need to quit talking about the governmental stuff. You just need to love each other. And all the pastoral people are saying, if you just love each other, everything would be okay. And we loved each other through the charismatic movement. We lost America. Because we didn't understand that we're an ecclesia called to disciple a nation. So while we were getting people saved, the world around us was discipling America. I said, while we were getting them saved, the world around us was discipling America. And they took over government. And they took over education. And they took over media and arts and entertainment. And we're going to take it back. Stand up for a second if you agreed and you clapped on that one. Come on. Lift up your hand. Lord, help me. Help me know what my role is in that part of taking back the culture. 
we got the priestly side down real good. The family part's great. I want to know what ecclesia means in my life. I want to translate this into how I act today when I leave here differently. I don't want it to be a theory. I want to put it into practice. I want to put it into practice how to be a king in this culture, how to be Eleazar when everybody else is retreating. I'm going to take my stand. And I'm going to defeat that enemy in Jesus' name. So, Lord, I speak over every one of your people. They've got their hands up now because they're volunteering for this army. Like he said, we're a remnant of the remnant. It's much easier to bask in the family side and never deal with the contending side. But nothing comes into existence without resistance. There will always be contending. When there's anything valuable on the line, the enemy is going to fight you for it. He doesn't counterfeit pennies. He counterfeits 20s and 100s because they're worth something. But we are an an untapped power source for the Lord. That if we will step into the kingly role that we've been given, we're a kingly priesthood. Lord, I just speak it over everyone here that you will translate this theory into practice in their lives and you will show them what to do and they will not be satisfied until they find that calling in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There you go. Now, I just want to tell you that's part of a 20-minute, 22-minute video. You could sit uh, on our YouTube channel. Okay, I don't know. Have anybody of you gone on our YouTube channel? There's a lot of good videos on there. And, um, and that 22-minute version was taken down from like an hour and a half version. So there's seven different things he talks about in that talk. And I only showed you like three minutes, but you could feel the anointing on it, right? So you need to equip yourself. That's what we say right on our bulletin there, that we're an equipping center. So you should tap into the equipping that's getting done and, and use what's available to you. How am I doing on time? Okay. Let's go into the third dimension here. Anybody remember the band, The Fifth Dimension? This is the third dimension. (laughs) And it's really funny because God, over and over, you see these patterns in the Bible of threes, right? You could start with Father, Son, Holy Spirit, death, burial, resurrection, outer court, inner court, holy of holies, first, second, and third heaven, baptism by water, fire, and by the Spirit, spirit, soul, and body, faith, hope, and love, The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. You're getting the point here, right? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of them. And then the one, I'm sorry, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then who is and who was and who is to come. So I said it by boot camp, maneuvers, and then warfare, right? This is life. It happens over and over and over again. It keeps on cycling in a lot of different ways. You can see yourself in different stages at different times in different parts of your life. Some things you're just being trained in. Other things you're doing the maneuvers and you're learning, but it's still safe. And then the third step is active warfare where the bombs are real. They're not shooting a little you know, cap gun at you, not a firecracker. It's like, man, this week there were people blowing off fireworks close to us, and it was reverberating really loud. And it it definitely made the point of what it would be like to be in war, to feel that concussion coming through your body. Well, that third point is where he wants us to live in this season, where we're leading up into the, the, the tabernacle's season. It's possessing the land. It's having that king side of you to make the tough decisions to rule while still being aligned with the priest so you're not killing people that God wants you to be aligned with. Because if you take it too far on the king side, you just start acting like Michael Corleone. Anybody gets in your way, you just kill them. No, that's not a king. Because you live by the sword, you will. Yeah, yeah, that's right. All right, so um, just for the sake of time, I'm going to go a little faster here. Take away, if you could just take away that you have both of these roles in your life, that would make me really happy, the king and the priest. But just look at a little bit of history here. It says the early church struggled with the fact that Jesus was from the house of David. It meant Jesus was qualified to be Messiah or king, but it disqualified him from being a high priest who should have been from which house? Of Levi. But then in Hebrews 17, it points out that in Psalm 110, the king is said to be a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. 
Now, no preacher out there would start talking about Melchizedek at 12.12 in the afternoon, which I think is what time it is right now. But you, that'll be another day's topic. But just understand that he came, Abraham gave his tithe to Melchizedek. He was a king and a priest of Salem, which was Jerusalem. So wonderful foreshadowing. And then I'm going to go to that actual verse in Hebrews 7. It says, This king priest didn't arise because of a genealogical right under the law to be a priest, but by the power of an indestructible resurrection life. That's what we have. We don't rise to a priesthood because of our birthright. We have it through the right of Jesus Christ. Coming in under that covenant of Abraham, we are now under the covenant of Jesus. And because he was a king priest and we're now adopted into his family, that's who we are. We're king priests because of the power of his indestructible resurrection life. For it was says in the Psalms, Melchizedek is a king priest forever. The old order of priesthood has been set aside as weak and powerless. The law has never made anyone perfect. But in its place is a far better hope, which gives us confidence to experience intimacy with God. That's what we have. All right, I have, I'm just going to go to the last one that gives you the thing that I wanted to finish with. Lord, help us understand this role as kings and priests at the same time. Help us understand what it means to govern, like what Dutch Sheets was saying. There's nothing wrong with the oikos, the family side, the priestly side. That's important. When we're together, we should feed each other and grow and be examples for each other. But we should also then spur one another on, it says in the New Testament. Spur one another on to do great works. A spur is what the cowboys had on the back of their boots to spur that horse on. We're supposed to be saying to each other, you have a calling on your life and you need to fill that calling because the world needs you in that role. And this is from the message. It says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, Go out into the world uncorrupted, a breath of fresh air in a squalid and polluted society. <laughs> Ever feel that way? Yeah. Ever feel like you got to hold your nose before you go into a work situation? Or some of the places you get off on the subway in New York City and the things they have showing? Like now it's not just posters on, on the bus stops. They have movies showing. And, you know, the one I saw, it was just, I can't even talk about how defiling it was. What is now supposed to be considered normal of what people do together. It was, it was horrible. But it's just, they're trying to normalize sin and, and make you desensitized to it. And you can't ever become desensitized to it and be a king and a priest. Because the truth is right here, right? This is the rule book. This is what you have to follow, not what the world says is normal, what this says is normal. And, and, you know, call it out as a king, but operate in it as a priest. Lord, how do you want me to handle this situation when I'm stepping into a zone? Man, it's pretty, pretty uh, graphic language there. A squalid and polluted society. Yes, thank you. Our prayers make a difference. You should have a mic down there. You should. <laughs> Look what it says. Provide people with a glimpse of good living and of the living God. <laughs> That's the message. Carry the light-giving message into the night. There's your marching orders. Navy SEALs. <laughs> Provide people with a glimpse of good living and of the living God and carry the light-giving message into the night. And then we should stand for this last one. And I know it's a little harder to read these slides, but those of you that can see it, you read it out loud with me, okay? I'm going to hold the mic to my foot. You hear it? Put your foot down. Because it says, but now. Makes a difference, doesn't it? I'm putting my foot down. <laughs> but now. In a single victorious stroke of life, there you go, sin, guilt, death are gone. With all this going for us, my dear, dear friends, stand your ground. Say that again. Stand your ground. One more time. Stand your ground and don't hold back. Throw yourselves into the work of the master. 
confident that nothing you do for him is a waste of time or effort. One more time, can you lift your hands, Lord? I speak over your people that nothing they do in the kingdom of God, nothing they do, a drink of cold water in your name is redemptive for the kingdom of God. Nothing that we do for you is a waste of time. It's all going to account for eternity. Do you know this? Do you really understand it? Ask him to help you get it, that when we die, there's going to be even a greater mission for us on the other side. We are going to rule with him in eternity as priests and kings. Paul said, I got caught up into the third heaven and I got shown things that no human is ever allowed to repeat. So we don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but we know it's going to be spectacular. So don't lose your will. Don't lose your effort to serve God. Keep serving him saying there's a greater, higher calling on my life than what I could see in the natural here. I'm going to do what I know to do. And I'm going to walk in the fullness of who he called me to be. He has a great plan for my life and your life. Say amen. amen. There might be somebody here that doesn't know the Lord. Okay, it would be wrong for us to close without offering somebody an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. Is there anybody here who said yes to Jesus? Be Pentecostal. All right. That was a little. But there might be somebody who never said yes to Jesus because maybe nobody ever asked them. There's more and more people in our culture that don't even know that they're supposed to be saved. And they say saved from what? And it's saved from sin. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? And Jesus made himself available for us. That cross is up there to remind us that we deserve to be punished for our sin. But when we came in relationship to God, he said, you know what? I'm going to stand in the place for your punishment. If you'll accept me as Lord, you get that substitution. I'll take the punishment for you. Serve me. How many said yes to that prayer? A lot of people. A couple more Pentecostals. Make some noise. Because it was the best decision you ever made. Right? Well, that's, that should be part of your answer here. And somebody that didn't say that might say, well, I'm going to have to change my life. Yes, you are. You're going to have to change your life. That's true. You go to the cross with him, and some old stuff dies, but the real you comes to life because the relationship you've always wanted is in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and this is the book that he gives you to understand. And you've got plenty of people around you that will help you understand it. And don't worry about that part. Get in right relationship with God. Apologize to him for the way you've lived and ways that you've gone off course. But understand, he still loves you. That's a hard one to understand, isn't it? But he still loves you because he made you in his image. And he's been waiting for you to come back to him. He's waiting with open arms, not ready to punish you, not ready to knock you down, ready to accept you into his arms. All because you humble yourself and you say, I'm sorry. That's called repenting. So maybe we could just close our eyes and, and let's just say a prayer out loud together. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of your son, Jesus. Understanding now that there's sin in my life and I can't save myself. I deserve to be punished. Jesus didn't, but he took my punishment and took my place on the cross. I choose today to turn from my sin, to follow you and to accept you as the Lord of my life. Fill me with your power through your Holy Spirit that I might serve you, follow you, fulfill the calling that you placed on my life while I'm alive and then to spend eternity with you because of this great gift of salvation that Jesus gave me. I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I turn over the reins of my life and I trust you as my Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I hope somebody said that prayer today. If not in here, somewhere on wherever this goes, because it goes further than you realize. And you can't ever forget to give people an opportunity to meet the most important 
person in your life. Keep talking about it. Don't be afraid to tell them the reason for the hope that you have. Amen. Did anybody say that prayer? Yeah. Trisha's coming up to get saved. I did say the prayer. <laughs> um, so as my husband was praying, I heard the Lord say this. And, and, and I, I, the Lord is asking for those right in your seat, for those who, who need to surrender to the Lord. There's a surrendering process that has to take place where we all have to do it, where we all have to just say, Lord, I give up. I bow my knee to you, and I just surrender all. I surrender my opinions. I surrender my thoughts. I surrender it all, my mindsets. Because there, I've heard the Lord say there's some that have been stuck, and the Lord says that it's not going to be your way. And the Lord is saying, surrender. Just give it up. And, and just surrender your will to him because he wants to direct your path. He wants you to hear his voice clearly. The Lord has called us to be priests and kings. He's called us to walk with that authority. He's called us to have minister unto the Lord first. That's our first call. And so the Lord is asking you today, will you surrender your heart? If you haven't, I mean, I'm, I'm daily surrendering my heart to the Lord. But the Lord wants us to walk in greater power and authority than ever before. And it's not my will, Lord, but it's your will be done. That's right. Because every time I've gone ahead of the Lord, I've, I've messed up. Mm. So, Lord, I repent for, for being stagnant. And so, Lord, today, Lord, my desire is to walk in that office of a king yes. and a priest. Yes. And in that office, Lord, I surrender my will to you, the commander-in-chief. During uh, worship today, or during prayer, Carolyn had a dream, and, and we all needed to release a word of what we heard the Lord say. And what I saw, and I didn't release it, was I saw a spine, and I saw the Holy Spirit adjusting our spines, aligning us. So, Lord, as we surrender today, Lord, we thank you for the download, for that alignment yeah. from heaven. Thank you, Lord. Lord, where we've been out of joint, Lord, you're bringing us back into alignment. Father, to hear your voice and to move forward with power and authority, that dunamis power that you've given us to operate in, to shift things, that we will not allow sin to be normalized, O oh God. And we will not allow it to infiltrate our lives, O oh God. And so, Lord, we just say no to that. And, Lord, we just thank you for your glory and the light of yeah. your presence upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you want prayer about that, you know, we're happy to pray with you. I know there's prophetic teams here today. But the surrender of our heart is one of the most important things that any of us can do. And that, that we don't, because, see, God doesn't want us to have a hard heart. And, uh, and we really do have great authority. And we do have great, God has called, we have the kingdom of God in us. And so we need to speak to those things, to speak to New York City, to speak to these cities that normalize sin. That's right. That, norm, that, have, that have signs in the window that I love my two mommies, you know, uh, and, and, and men kissing men. I'm sorry. Listen, the Lord loves everybody. That's right. He, he, lo he died on the cross for all. Hey, fornication's just as bad, okay? So I'm not trying to single anything out. But we have to speak to these things. We have that authority over that. That's why we have to really recognize and understand our kingly anointing, our priestly anointing. Yes, Lord. So, Lord, we just thank you that you have given us yes, authority. Lord. Lord, your word says that we shall decree that thing, and it shall be established yes, unto shall. us. And the light of your countenance will overshadow us. And even those that are not innocent that we're praying for will come to know yes, you, Lord. Lord. That's what your word says. So, Lord, we just thank you for the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you. For the blood that the enemy can't stand against. Lord, we come and we war from a place of victory. We're not defeated. We already won. We have to get rid of that uh, victim mentality that we're all defeated and it's, we're all going to hell and everybody. That's baloney. Yeah. We are seated in heavenly places. Yes. And so, Lord, we just thank you for turnaround. We thank you that you're a God of restoration. Yes. I'm telling you, even in marriages. Yes, Lord. It's give up your right to be right. Both surrender and allow the Lord to be king over your yeah. marriage. So, Lord, we just thank you for restoration and relationships. We thank you for restitution. These are some of the words in prayer. We thank you for redemption. We thank you for a recalibration. We thank you for, for revolution. 
Lord, we thank you that revival and refreshment is and refreshing is coming over our lives as we surrender. We're not to be a stagnant, passive people. That's right. We're to be a Holy Ghost fired up, spirit filled, tongue talking people. Yes, Lord. That sees and experiences the power of God of signs, wonders, and miracles in Jesus' name. So, Lord, we just bless each and every person here to be fire-breathing powerhouses in Jesus' name. Amen. Another example of somebody, I'm glad they're on our side. Stretch your hands towards these people that come up for prayer to accept the Lord. Amen. It's exciting, isn't it? Hallelujah. Lord, we just say, good ground. Good ground. Let this seed fall in good ground. Thank you, Father, that their hearts, their lives have been set apart for you now. That they, they made that confession of lordship. And we just say, Lord, move in their lives. How many of you, he met you right, right where you were at. When you said yes, he knew exactly where you were at. Lord, we thank you. You know exactly where they're at right now. And you know exactly what they need done in their lives and done for their lives. Help them not to overcomplicate this, but just to fall deeply in love with you, deeply in love with you, that the things of this world would grow strangely dim in the light of your glory. Lord, we speak life over them right now. We speak resurrection life over them right now, away from that death scene and into your life, that you would fill them with your spirit, you would fill them with your power, that you would show them the, the plan that you have for their lives and the great victory that they have over Satan who tried to destroy them but who lost and is a defeated foe and they are now more than conquerors through Christ who's in them. Let Jesus Christ be the hope of glory in their lives in Jesus' name. Amen.